So, um, yes, thanks for introducing me and thanks for the invitation in general. Um, I really think it's a great conference to organize. Um, and I have the chance to introduce a broad topic, uh, which is digital participation, outreach, and lessons from the pandemic. Um, I guess my um, the context of what I'm going to say is that um, I'm, I want to, through my example, which will be the city of New York and how we worked with them for a year now, um, we can give you the keys of some key arguments to say that even though there's a pandemic, uh, we can still organize digital participation processes. Uh, we can still use um, some old methods of participation um, and still pursue a digital participation process and engage citizens in that process. So I'm just going to start. Um, so this project um, is the result of a partnership between um, so us, Open Source Politics, that we are based in France, so we're from Paris, um, and a partnership between us and Digidem Lab, uh, a lab in, uh, in Sweden uh, that is also very focused on digital participation, outreach, and those topics. And another NGO called Coro in the US, um, which focuses more on youth participation. So how do we engage more youth, especially in this pandemic? Uh, what are the new solutions that we can find to engage citizens? Um, so the way I turned this you know, presentation is that it was a PB first design before the pandemic and it got implemented in the midst of it. Um, so it was really, it got delayed. It's not a surprise. Uh, it was complicated to, to implement it as well. Um, we, the launch date got delayed by five months, I think. Um, it was the first cooperation of European uh, NGOs and, and firms in the US for the city of New York. So there was also some administrative uh, delay, um, but that was, you know, what made also the project really interesting and see every step of, you know, how you can organize both in the pandemic and in the U.S. elections, which was also another context um, in, a, in the uh, in the late of the year. Um, so I guess what I want to do with this presentation is both show you uh, the level of design, so how we, you know, design every step of the PB and uh, each of the steps, which were really interesting to see because um, it also included citizens, um, just in general, PBs, participatory budgeting can be a really classic uh, participatory process. And it's in the way that you actually renew it with the citizens and you design it with the citizens that it can get really interesting um, and also design it with local NGOs that actually know uh, more about the, the context of it. Um, that's where you get a PB that's really interesting, even though uh, what I wanted to tell you in the introduction is that um, it is a PB organized by the city, by the local institution with NGOs that really had a good um, role in place in the project. Um, so that was really interesting. So I'll just get into it before I take too much time. Uh, so that was a platform that we designed for uh, to host um, the, the PB participation. So we use Decidim, a platform that is open source, really important for us. Um, you might have know, you might have encountered it because uh, it's the European platform. Uh, but it means that any type of actor that wants any local NGO, any type of actor that wants to implement Decidim can do it. Uh, and that's a really important part of it. Um, the fact that the city of New York cho chose open source tools was something also that was very new for this project. So the, the process kind of was designed in a few steps. Uh, the first one being a needs assessment. So we would have for the summer um, a, a period where we use police. It's a tool uh, made in the US as well, open source, uh, that allows you to um, map opinion groups. And we basically asked uh, young people what um, their needs was in terms, what their needs were, sorry, in terms of uh, COVID relief uh, in local and hyperlocal in their in their area and the area most hit by the COVID. Uh, so that was the first step. Uh, they were helped to do this. Uh, there were some sessions, some uh, office hours online. Um, some solutions were given by the um, the organizers to actually have multiple ways of them contributing. So that was an important part of the outreach. Um, and then the second step was just idea collection, having the most ideas, that was in the same parallel time, um, having the most, uh, as many ideas from, from, the, from the youth. 
And then when you see with the PB is that once uh, that's pretty brand, um, that's a pretty novel thing to do in the, in the PB is basically asking uh, youth, uh, so young people to join with organizations, youth organizations to submit a common idea to the public procurement process. Um, so the, the, the idea you see here, the project you see here is both a mix of an idea that was submitted by the citizen, the youth, and um, an organization that could actually implement the project. Um, so that was something really interesting to see from this project. And that was all in the midst of the COVID. So they had different ways of uh, participating um, and I'll get that, I'll get into it after. Um, then there was a voting phase, which is very classic also in the, in the, in the PB phase. Um, and then the announcing the winners. So those are the steps that I wanted to go quite uh, quickly through them because you need to know the context. But I think the most important thing to know is that uh, when you design a PB and you want to make it more innovative uh, and any kind of digital processes in general, you have to think about what kind of partnerships you want. Um, and that's maybe in the, one of the first questions you have to ask yourself, uh, either whether you are an NGO yourself or um, a, public, a civil servant, a uh, public institution at any, at any level. Um, so what we had with this uh, New York project is that we had, you know, some partnership with CBOs, so community-based organizations. Um, we also chose to, you know, expand the, the different ways in which people could participate. Um, so collecting issues, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And just so you know, the, the, the thing, maybe the main thing we had in mind when we said, um, when we started the PB is that it was gonna be 100% digital, but the outreach itself could be done in schools by partnering with public schools. It could be done by partnering with local libraries to, to host some votes, for example, if voting was too complicated for some population to do online. Um, so it's all those kinds of um, ideas that need to be put forward for uh, in the design uh, phase. And then it was also about educating young people, and that's more in the context of it, but educating young people and in general the population as to what the PB process is and how important it is and how important it is to renew it in order not for it to be top down, but actually be a result of, um, you know, grassroots movement and or again putting forward projects that are uh, key for, um, you know, policy solving, etc. Um, so it's important also, so I'll just share some of the lessons um, here. Um, it's not because in-person meetings, hence traditional methods of participation are more complicated to organize with the pandemic, that citizen engagement should be put on the side. That's maybe one of the main ones, because uh, that's, you know, it's not a given for some, for some cities and countries. And it's more, now more than ever important that public institutions and civil society um, ask for assistance from local geos and actors to move up in the participation scale. So what you see on the right, sorry, it's in French. It's basically like in the pandemic, participation got leveled down to just, you know, giving, providing information, uh, maybe implicating them in the phase of um, just, you know, building, designing the, the post pandemic world. That was something very dystopic that we had uh, in the first lockdown. It was, we need to think about what's gonna be the rest of the, the, the post pandemic world. Um, and basically people were implicated in that, um, in that consultation, but because of the pandemic, it, the other levels of participation got, kind of got slowed down, uh, namely the partnership, the direct democracy, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's now more than ever important that we, you know, give assistance and educate also local institutions into how they can move up on that scale. Um, then, yeah, um, so outreach methods need to reach communities that are less tech savvy, namely by giving them multiple options to participate and alloc allocating resources to help them participate. Um, we had the chance to have, you know, um, in cities, in New York, they have resources for that. It's part of the culture. In France, when we started, uh, you know, when the pandemic started, there was way less resources uh, for organizing participation and solidarity. So it was more about how you can reallocate resources, reorganize to help citizens participate. Uh, how do you do that? Do you organize office hours, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and that was mainly the main, um, the main challenge at the beginning. 
Um, and that's something you might, you know, you talk through your um, research and that's very important is um, getting to know the fabric of local actors and their role in this crisis management was just as important to organize online communities. Um, we need to like, that's why New York is not applied to its different context. Um, and this context, you know, in your own context, you need to know, and I'm sure you know, the fabric of local actors. I'll get a little bit faster. Um, yeah, something important. Sometimes we think about participatory processes as these very complex, deliberative, you know, one year long uh, processes. Um, sometimes it's better to do simple and clear processes, participatory processes, than you know, go the, the next mile. I think I'm done. Um, I hope I didn't get too long with my presentation. And I hope you have some, you know, answers or questions for me after. Thank you.